Ladies and gentlemen, give yourselves a round of applause. This is how we start Pat Kissy Month in the Bay Area. Live in Oakland right now. Let me say this, I am not going to be long, but I will be strong. All right? Who did you come to see over here? Who did you come to see? Who did you come to see? Why did you do it? How many of you came to see someone that goes by the name of Knowledge Brain Supreme over nearly everyone? KRS One, philosopher, teacher, poet, author, humanitarian, strong brother, born and raised in New York. I'm not going to do the full introduction. If you don't know who KRS One is, I would suggest you really go research. But I will say, 20 years and 20 albums. How many of you got criminal minded? How many of you got I Got Next? <laughs> How many of you have heard the new song where he's dealing with the Aztecs, as technical, just like that? It is an honor and a privilege to be on this stage to give to you history knowledge, overstanding, inspiration that we desperately need right now. Without further ado, I'm gonna keep it really short and sweet because I'm excited to come sit here and to hear our brother, until, you know, hindsight. You, you never know when you're actually in a historical moment until weeks later or when the event becomes historical. Hello, Aisha. Hey. <laughs> uh, you, you know, so I start here because this is what is most important. I'm going to start with young people work my way right up. Because history, we're talking about, well, it's February 1st, black, black history. We're starting off Black History Month, African History Month. Let me run through a few things regarding history real quick. I only got a little bit of time to talk, so I'm not going to try to talk too philosophical or, or metaphysical. But it's very hard to talk about African American male achievement without going into the depth of a person's being. Uh, this, this concept here, man, I like to start, man. A uh, male, you know, man, that thing. Uh, history and this world. To make a long story short, first of all, big up to God, Carl. Uh, G. Woodson for Negro History Week, which then became Black History Month. And it's a shame. This history, this, this month has a bittersweet to it. Because in one breath, why do you have to have a month dedicated to the teaching of African history? The other side to it is that you have a month dedicated <laughs> to the teaching of African history. This is a bittersweet. The bitter is obviously, why do we have to have a month? Isn't African history all year round? Isn't this something we live and deal with? Blah, blah, blah. Why only a month? I like to take it even further. 
When we discuss African history, why do we only discuss Africans? Now ride with me here. African History Month, or Black History Month, when you trace the history of African Americans through their African lineage, you come to the beginnings of humanity itself. You come to, you come to a place of great responsibility. You can't say Africa is the cradle of civilization and then come from Africa and care nothing about civilization. Or you say, humanity, all of humanity walked out of Africa. So then if we're studying African history, shouldn't we be studying human history? There's, there's a responsibility to being an African. It's not just about your great achievements. It is. But it's not just about that. It is also about your responsibility. Now, if you are truly of African consciousness, at least in February, <laughs> you should at least during this time, I'll put a spin on it and say, of course, you should study your African history, study African American history, fascinating history. But if you are responsible for the African American lineage, if you are responsible for the heritage and the reason that the month was even created, then we're going to have to update our study of Africa. African American male achievement. In history, we've been studying African history as only black people through certain periods of time. And this is also incomplete. Because during African history, we should discuss the entire human race. And here's why. Because there was never a time in human history that Africans were not all over the world at once. Never a time. From the beginning of, and I don't want to say recorded history, just the beginning of history, which is also oral, you have, you have a response, of, you have two types of human. One type of human says, I'm only worried about me and mine. Another type of human says, I'm not having no fun unless the guy next to me is having some fun. <laughs> One person wants it all for themselves. Another person wants to share. One person feels good that they have it all to themselves. Another person feels great when they share. The question with this word here, man, has to do with your ability to share. People think that manhood is about only about protection and provision. I will provide and protect. <laughs> and that makes me a man. But we are now in the 21st century. The old version of male doesn't work anymore. You guys have internet now, computers. Wow. The male of 20 years ago is not the male of today. I don't know, many of you might not know of this guy. His name is Stokely Carmichael. He, was, uh, he changed his name to Kwame Torre. And he led a, 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 an organization called the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Now, in the 90s, I was touring with Kwame Touré. We were doing lectures. 
And one thing he told me, I'll share with you right here, because it goes to this word, African-American male. I asked him, I said, you know, we hear all kinds of stories about the civil rights movement and what was really going on and the counterintelligence program, FBI, and all that. What really happened? You know what he told me? This is going to shock you all, but maybe not. He said there were two problems with the civil rights struggle. Two. Only two. First one. Never again, he said, should there be one charismatic leader. That from now on, our children have to be all trained to be leaders. That's right. Yes. All. That's one. In the 60s, 50s, even 40s, you had one charismatic leader and everyone followed that. That can be no more. Everyone must lead now. Here's the other one. He said the number two thing. We kept our women in the kitchen and the bedroom. Oh, this is getting deep now. Oh, yeah. Number two problem with the civil rights movement. Women were not given a voice. Number two problem. People don't like talking about it, but I'm going to hit you with it now because it relates to this word here. If you can't respect women, you are not a man. of your queen, whether that be your wife, your mother, your sister, or your daughter. Not only is it the protection and provision for them, but if you yourself are not healthy, you disrespect them. Listen to what I'm saying. As a man, if you are not up on your feet, your queen can become disrespected. And why? Not that women are, you know, like she's just there. Not at all. Everyone has a role to play. And this is what we have gotten away from. And this is why so many societies and families are falling apart. We have law, but no order. You know, it used to go together. It used to be two things, law and order. <laughs> now you only have law. Do this, do that, go here, go there, don't go here, don't go there. But no order. Everything's out of order. Sons are not being sons. Daughters are not being daughters. Fathers, fathers, mothers, mothers. Nobody's being what they're supposed to be. If everyone would just Get in their place. <laughs> the entire society would rise, but this is how societies rise. Only a few men and women, but we're talking about men, a few men get together 
and they say, you know what? I'm tired of this. Look at my neighborhood. Look at these cops. Take a look at the hospital. Take a look. I can't deal with this. It's not where I want to raise my children. How are you going to get free? Here's what I want to talk about. This is history. When you talk about history, you talk about black history. The tradition has been when we come together to talk about freedom. That's been the tradition. So I'm going to add a little bit of freedom in this. Put a period here on man. If you know what a man really is, men, a man, the other part of woman, that, that thing, once you know you are a man, first, no other man, no other man can tell you who you are, why you are, what you do, why you do what you do. No other man, there's no fear of another man. When you are a man unto yourself, first, you are free. Why are you free? Here's how you get free. Women, and never forget this, this is for the young people in the audience. Women make men free. This is a secret knowledge. I'm going to tell it to you right now. Listen to me. Your first knowledge is from your mother. Your first character, who you're going to be, that doesn't come from dad. Dad kicks in later. Way you down the line when you're a crazy teenager. <laughs> That's when dad kicks in. But mom, 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 mom gives us our first education. Mom tells us what a man is. And this is the controversial piece right here. Why are men bugging out? Because women are not teaching us anything. We are in a society where we believe that men lead the society. That's, the, that's not true, that's just wrong. In every society on the planet, it is led by women. Every indigenous culture, every, every civilization, just do the homework. It starts with the woman at the center of the family. All the boys in the family praise the woman. Or the mother in that instance. All the daughters and the sisters are trying to be like the mother, the matriarch. Trying to be the mother. The mother is the wealth of the family. She owns the land. She owns the house. She gave you your knowledge. She's the nurturer. She's all you got. But what happened? Now you're in a society that tells you that women are less and men are supposed to be on top and leading everything. This is the problem with African-American male achievement. Right here. We're being taught by a westernized education that puts men on top. Now, if we're brave enough, if we're brave enough to really look at the truth and say, during African History Month and during a conversation like African American Male Achievement, the greatest achievement an African American male could ever experience, the greatest achievement that an African American male can experience is a wife. You're going to be home thinking, 
thinking about this? Like, what was he talking about? He's going to hit you right up. Listen to what I'm saying. The greatest, the greatest African-American male achievement is an African-American wife. Someone, your partner, who's going to walk through this dimension of time with you. This is what men should know. Not that you need to chase after women. Not that you need to not be an independent man. But the joy of being married over 10, 15, or 20 years is in, you don't experience life. Speak on it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't experience life without someone you can trust. If you go through life with no one on your side that you can trust, you really don't succeed in life. Or, or when I say this, you'll succeed in your career, but you won't succeed in life. You'll succeed in your career, yes you will, but your life, which is, should be most important to you, this is what I'm talking about. I would suggest everyone here, when you leave here, especially the men, men when you leave here, just as an exercise, reconcile with a woman. You know, this is the strength. You know, men can live all kinds of, we talk about being strong. You want to break a man down? Uh, apologize to a woman tonight. Some you know you did. Some you know was crazy. And you've been holding it, and she's been holding it, as the man, as the man, if you want to honor African History Month, honor our discussion today, engage your woman. <laughs> Encourage your woman. She had two kids, me and my brother Kenny. Man disappeared. There she is with me and two kids, uh, two, um, uh, her and two boys. She's raising us. She's terrified because she's a single parent. And she's a single parent in the 60s, which was another issue. But she's a single parent, and she has these two boys, and she's praying up at night. And I would say this to all mothers in, in a similar situation uh, in, in, in that sense. If you are strong, your kids will be strong. If you strong, they strong. And I know this firsthand because I lived a poor life, man. My mother didn't have nothing. I mean, I don't know how many of y'all know about, you know, having welfare and working at the same time. Yeah. You're not supposed to. <laughs> You know, like that, you know? And like, my mother did it all. She drove cab. I mean, she did it all. And me and my brother, we were, we was proud of her. You see, look at what I'm saying to you. This is, this is African-American male that she right. We didn't look up to men. Right. We was trying to compete with them. I'm a big 
we had dad. That we, that's men. We look up to our mother. Everybody in the hood looked up to their mother and looked up to your mother. When your mother walked down the street, your man was like, yo, there's your mom. <laughs> yeah. Straighten up. <laughs> you know, everybody respects the mother. The mother. So to put a period here, if there is one thing to achieve, to teach our children, and to also acknowledge during this month, I would point it to women. I would put women at the center of the family. I would have men surrounding women. Yes. Women should be thinking for their families. Yes. They should be working for their families. They should be protecting their families. Yes. This will show the young boys what they're supposed to be doing. It's the mother that teaches the son, the young man, how to be a man. So mothers that are in the audience today, this African-American male achievement is more for you than it is for any black man in here. It's more for you. You are the reason why we're stumbling. You are the reason why we built the pyramids. You, you are the reason. Now as a man, if you can adopt this kind of psychology, where when you walk up to a woman, you see her as a goddess, yes. not a queen, a god, deity in front of you. Many people say, I'm praying to God. I want to be in the presence of God. I am on a journey to find enlightenment, oneness with God. <laughs> All you gotta do is thank a woman. All you have to do is empower a woman, and that woman will empower you. <laughs> it is very simple. I know I'm talking to women in the audience. Very simple. Now, that's half my time. About 10 minutes. Let's talk about hip hop. African-American male achievement. I got 10 minutes. Hip hop. Hip hop began in 1973 in, a, in the Bronx at a place called 1520 Sedgwick Avenue in the Bronx. A Jamaican dude named Cool DJ Herc came from Jamaica in 1967. Uh, well, first of all, Jamaica gets its independence in 1962. Then you have this immigrant, this immigration of Jamaicans and Barbados and Trinidadians and Haitians and Cubans and people are coming into the United States. And what they're bringing to the United States is a forgotten African vibe that American blacks forgot. It started with a guy named Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey, another Jamaican, comes to the United States preaching African unity. All black people, let's go back to Africa, unite the whole of Africa, and start our own nation. Three million African Americans agreed with him. They started the largest movement you can imagine. Of course, he got deported eventually because the FBI wasn't having that. And neither was the NAACP. So at the end of the day, uh, Marcus Garvey's movement goes out, and this is hip hop. Marcus Garvey's movement goes out about starting a black nation. And even though it is called a black nation, the, the premise of this nation is really all of humanity, which is what blackness is. It's what African is. 
Africans in Africa never called themselves Africans. They called themselves human beings. They didn't know what African is. If you went, went to ancient Africa and said, Africa, they'd say they point you toward Europe. <laughs> this concept of African, the African consciousness, is a divine consciousness. It's not a human consciousness. Human comes later when you start getting different cultures, ethnicities, this, that, and the other. But if you just dig to the deepest core of African or whatever, Asian, European, anything, you dig to the deepest core of it, it's consciousness. It's spiritual. It's non-tangible. You can't touch it. And so Marcus Garvey comes out with a consciousness-raising movement. This is important. There's no land to go get other than Africa, but there's no, there's no place for you really to be. It's something for you to be. Marcus Garvey, his movement goes out all over the United States. He influences, he influences a small uh, family in Nebraska, uh, the little family uh, in uh, Nebraska, and um, they have a, a this family produces Malcolm X. Um, uh, obviously, his mother, I'm struggling for their names, uh, Malcolm X's mother and father were Garveyites. Uh, and they were studying, they were actually organizing for Garvey in Nebraska. And it was the Klan that came to Malcolm X's father and said, you know, you continue this uh, type of uh, activity and we're gonna kill you. Of course, he put the middle finger up and he kept doing his thing, and they killed him eventually. They threw him in front of a train, and a train hit him, ran him over. And hit Malcolm X's mother went crazy. She couldn't deal with that. So they locked her up in an insane asylum. Malcolm's father's dead. So Malcolm now becomes this person with this hatred for white people. He's like, look, you killed my father. You sent my mother to an insane asylum. I'm going all out right now. So he, I guess his going all out was to date two white women. <laughs> uh, and so Malcolm <laughs> found himself robbing apartments <laughs> with these two white chicks with him. And they, three of them got arrested one night. The two white women, they get off because they're white. Malcolm goes to jail for 10 years. In jail, Malcolm becomes a Muslim, meets a, a Muslim in jail. Muslim brother turns him on to Elijah Muhammad and the Quran and all of it, the teachings of, of the nation of Islam. And Malcolm takes it in. But again, what was Elijah Muhammad teaching? He was teaching consciousness, how to think, how to think. Malcolm X goes on to become one of the lead ministers of Mosque Number no. 7. He's running New York. There's even a street named after him in New York now. <laughs> but not much good on But before that, he's running around in New York trying to wake people up. You know the story. He goes to Mecca. He comes back. He realizes that the, white, the racial problem is not white against black, it's ignorance against knowledge. And when he returned from Mecca, he had a whole new outlook on what race is and what God is. And so Malcolm came back and then of course you know the rest of the story. I bring this up because this is where hip hop starts. We give our start uh, historically to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. because Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech outlines how hip hop actually came into the world. I don't have time to get into that now. Yes, you do. But, <laughs> but, but, but you can trace uh, Dr. King's speech where he says, uh, let freedom ring through the mountains of, of New York. 
Let freedom ring through the mountains of California. Let freedom ring through Atlanta. Let freedom ring in the world. When you look to I Have a Dream speech, he outlines every place that hip hop was to go prophetically uh, when you look at it. The point is, though, and that's why we give our origin to Dr. King, but Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, the Black Panther Party, uh, these groups was more about changing your thinking than trying to conform to an American mainstream way of life. This is what we have to remember during Black History Month. There are two black histories. There's the mainstream, black history, and then there's the struggle. The struggle is where hip hop comes from. We were the forgotten of our people. Hip hop is not all black. Don't get that twisted, that's mainstream. Just trying to make hip hop all male, all black male, because that's what white mainstream wants to see. But hip hop began with all kinds of people involved in it. Obviously, the fathers and mothers of hip hop are jet black Africans. <laughs> cool her, Africa Bam Bada, Grandmaster Flash, Dummy Fred. I mean, just black folk. <laughs> but when you talk about culture, not rock music, but when you talk about culture, you start to look at hip hop a little different. It's not just about rapping. It becomes, what are you the lineage of? Where do you come from? What's your point of view? What are you standing on? Here's the quick history. In 1973, Cool Herc comes out and he's playing James Brown records. One of his uh, songs that Young Nick and Black is saying, <laughs> saying, he said, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. That's James Brown. Uh, and another guy named Alfred Ellis. James Brown, Alfred Ellis wrote this song called Say It Loud, Black and I'm Proud. This song comes out actually in 68. It's still hot in <laughs> 2012, but it's still hot in 73. And Cool Herc is playing this song. Say it loud, and mind you now, try to get this in your head. We are outside, we are in the park. We are in a playground park, and a DJ brings his equipment out, two turntables, and it wasn't even a mix, it was like an amplifier in the middle there. And he would play James Brown, say funky drum. A one, two, three, four, hit it. Boom, boom, bop, 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 bop. And he'd lift the needle and drop it again. And it would play again. One, two, three, four, hit it. Boom, boom, bop, 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 bop. One, two, three, four, hit it. So while this music is doing this, a cool hurt is dropping this needle, stopping the record, playing it again, doing his thing. There's a female on the mic named Pebbly Pooh. <laughs> and she's doing it. This is the first female MC ever. She's still around, she works for Verizon. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. Crazy. But she's the first female MC was there with Cool Hurt. She's giving it to you. Rocking with the rock is jamming with the jam is cool. Hurt, 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 hurt. Cool Herc was so huge that he started to attract everyone who was like him. Now, who was he like? He was a DJ, an MC, a graffiti writer, uh, and a b-boy. He danced. He was a break dancer. He was all four of these at once. So he attracted DJs, MCs, graffiti writers, and, and break dances. These groups of people would come around and jam the cool art. 73, 74. A gang member, a guy named Kevin Donovan, is the leader of a gang called Black Spades. UNICEF puts out a writing contest and says, anybody who can write about Africa, we send it to Africa. 
So a gang member takes on the unisex text. I'll say that again. A gang member took a writing exam. <laughs> Went in with the jacket on, sat down, took a writing exam about Africa. One, hands down, beat out the entire city. Gang member. Beat the whole city. UNICEF sends him to Africa. He gets to Africa. The Zulu chief there says, you African Americans are doing the same thing we Africans have been doing here for years. It's called tribal warfare. You kill him for your block, he kills you for that block. All y'all doing, you don't see that this white dude is controlling everything. Africa Bambada took that in. Now notice what I just said. Kevin Donovan went to Africa. Come on, but it's a guy named Africa Bambata that heard the lesson. Kevin Donovan died in Africa. Come on. Come on. He became this guy named Africa Bambata. And this guy came back from Africa. He's the leader of the biggest gang in New York called the Black Spades. He gains consciousness. He comes back to New York, and he says, gangs are over in New York. <laughs> Look at what I just said. We can't even do that today. <laughs> he goes back to New York. Imagine, he's one gang. He's the black space. You got the savage skulls, savage nomads, young skulls, this one, that one, the other. He's one gang. He comes up and says, you know what? I just got back from Africa. We're all bugging. <laughs> We're all bugging. We need to stop this. And here's the other part. Every other gang leader agreed. They agreed. And in New York, gang violence ended overnight. 1974, they started an organization called Zulu Nation. Zulu Nation was all the gangs in New York putting colors down, putting guns, knives down, and now the way we was going to settle our differences was through art. This was genius. This was genius, and it was going on on the street level. These are street dudes thinking like this. So now, this thing Cool Herc was doing Attracting B-boys, MCs, graffiti writers, Africa Bambada took that whole group and said, okay, here's why we doing this. We doing this for peace, love, unity, and fun. That's the reason we do hip hop. For peace, love, unity, and joy. That is the only reason to do any of hip hop's elements. If you do an element, you rap, you draw, you break, whatever you do, if it's not leading to peace, it ain't hip hop. If it's not leading to love, it ain't hip hop. If it's not unifying your people, it ain't hip hop. Television is rap music. That is what that is, rap music. Hip hop, that's the struggle. That's the struggle. Give you a little more. A little more. Africa Bambada comes out in 74 and says hip hop is about peace, love, unity, having fun. That's it. All the gangs in New York said, that's it. This is what we're going to do. So some became B-boys, some became MCs, and we started what is called battles. Instead of me running up on you with a gun, let's write some rhymes. I can tell you anything I want to tell you in these rhymes. You can tell me anything you want to tell me in these rhymes. And we'll never touch each other. That's, that's outside the rules. Same thing with B-boys, breaking, graffiti writing, DJ. Same thing, rules apply in all of these elements. So the violence went down completely in New York City. 
There's no more gangs in New York. Cops didn't have nothing to do. Right. So they brought in crime. <laughs> 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 Who's in power? 
When we had no power because we had no money, we were illegal. When Rapper's Delight sells 10 million copies, we're legal now. And we're legal only because we're making money for corporate America. Now, do you understand where I'm going with this? When we're not making money for them, we're illegal. When we make making money for them, we legal. When we not making money for them, our music is offensive and obscene. When you get tens of billions off our music, this is it, it's a it's the number one record in the country. This right here was the first game played. Right here. First we illegal. Now we make it money, we ain't illegal no more. Okay, lesson one learned. Legal and illegal is based on rich poor. Who's in power? But we learned quickly that it wasn't just money that was the power. It was definition. The point here is this. The stories that you tell about yourself and about your environment is what makes you rich or poor. This is the secret. Whatever you say about yourself is what's going to happen. This is why, this is why you hear rappers all the time talk about money. I got this, I got that, you ain't got nothing. <laughs> rappers always talking about what they got. A good example is the song Rappers Delight. We got three guys from Jersey. And these guys, Big Bang Hank, Wonder Mike, Master G. And they're saying, I got a Lincoln Continental and a sunroof Cadillac. So after school, I take a dip in the pool? They didn't have none of this. <laughs> They didn't have none of this stuff. But check it out. After the record was recorded, they got it. So, in closing, if there's one thing that we can gain from African History Month, from Black History Month, is new ways to think. Think your way out of poverty. Think your way out of ignorance. You don't have to not know. You know, when I was coming up, and this is for, this is for the students in this school right here. When I was coming up, the, I had a French teacher who used to always try to tell us French. He was teaching French. And it was the most boring class. We didn't want to go. It was always the right thing. She's teaching us French. Now she asked me one day, so what are you going to be when you get older? I said, I'm going to be a rapper. Now I was like 12, 13. I used to always tell people that. I'm going to be an MC. I'm going to be an MC. And I told my teacher that. I'm going to be an MC. She was like, what? Because there was no industry, there was no rap industry, there was none of this. We were just doing it in the park. So I said, I'm gonna be an MC. And I never forget, she gave me a weird look, but like she didn't know what MC was. But she looked at me shocked that I had a plan. And she looked at me like, well, oh, okay, like, oh, okay, so I guess that's it. <laughs> like, like that. And, but here's the thing, though. So I'm being cocky to, I'm an MC. <laughs> she trying to teach me French. I don't need no French, I'm an MC, he talk English. <laughs> now here's how the mind works. I'm an MC, I'm an MC. Years go by, I become an MC. I record my record, somehow my mind brings me to where I'm supposed to be. 
I get off a flight in Paris, France. <laughs> I never forget this. I, my first time in Paris, I land in Paris. Can't speak the language. Can't speak the language. Just for young people, listen to me in this audience. You may think what your teachers are teaching you now don't make no sense in your life. You may think that what you're learning don't make no sense. But let me tell you, I didn't read this nowhere. I'm telling you, life experience. I got off in Paris, France. I couldn't even order a glass of water. <laughs> Listen, I had to spend $30,000 a week. Listen to me, $30,000 a week for a translator. For a transit, do you know how ignorant I felt? <laughs> and right away I'm going back in my mind, I'm like, wait a minute, didn't somebody try to show me? <laughs> of how you can live. You live right now in a prison. We all do. It's a prison. Cities are prisons. That's what this is. Matter of fact, to be more accurate, it's not even a prison. It's an experiment. It's like an insane asylum. That's what, that's what cities are. They're like insane asylums. And you look around. It's, it's, it's like we're having this mad experiment about how, to keep, how, how does humans develop and what happens if you throw this human in with that human in. What happened? And, and people are experiments called social sciences, social engineering, the new world order. That's what this is. And those who really know what time it is, like you can't waste your time. And I'm not talking about adults in the room. Y'all know, y'all here. But the young people in this room, if you don't respect your teacher, you can't respect no one in life. Because everyone, Everyone is a teacher. Teaching is the first profession. And before you can learn anything, you have to be taught it. Teaching, the idea of a teacher, is something you're going to see 
over and over and over again in your entire life. If you got problems with your teacher today, I advise you to get over those problems because your teacher is a reflection of a person in society you're gonna have to get around. To the young people in the audience, your teachers are human beings. They get aggravated, they get tired, they are joyful, they get depressed. The best teachers have the best students. The best teachers have the best students. It's the student that lifts the teacher up. We have all of these complaints against teachers. Why don't you raise the salaries? Let me start here. We don't have to wait. We don't have to wait for a federal government to take care of the human being that's teaching you. Preach! If you care anything for your teacher, deny yourself that, that Friday night dinner. Deny yourself that movie or whatever your pleasure is and give that money to your teacher. This is young people, I'm telling young people straight up. Young people straight up. Support your teacher. Like, get in the habit of thinking like that. Like, when you go to McDonald's, buy your teacher some fries. Like, straight up. Like, you know, think about the person that is making you better. Think about that person. And so, that's my conclusion in a happy black history. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up.